<sighs> Thank you very much. Are you are here in Bonn till uh, you got a you got a position here for uh Oh no no. Well I'm in Edinburgh. Ah okay. Okay. Yeah. I just for a trimester. Okay, I see. So you're in Edinburgh. Definitely not a permanent No. <laughs> Maybe one day. Permanent. Yeah well <laughs> I mean is it is it hard to have permanent positions? Yeah, yeah. But all, all around the, the United Kingdom or just in Scotland is, is difficult or? Yeah, in all of the UK. Yeah. There are not so many. Uh, yeah, right. Then I will have something to ask you afterwards. I will. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know because actually we were inspired by something you did. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I have to ask you something. And Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, it's nice to be here, and this gives gives this talk. It's not the first time that I that I that I talk about this. It's maybe the second, but this is the first time where the 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 the, the work is somehow complete. So I hope it's going to be clear. So uh, first of all, let me say it's a joint work with Matei Toma, um, which is an expert in. Uh, Modelized pieces of sheaves over non-algebraic stuff. So, uh, okay, the the main motivation com comes from the fact that we would like to uh, to extend to uh, this non-projective setting all the known, or at least not all, because maybe it's too much, but some of the known results about uh, modelized pieces of sheaves over projective K3 surfaces. I will only talk about K3 surfaces, even, even if I'm I'm pretty much sure that everything. Could be done even for complex tor, two-dimensional complex tori. 
So uh, this is the main motivation, and it seems to be pretty natural because if you, whenever you would like to deform modelized spaces of sheaves over some projective K3 surface, then it turns out that you go to something which is non-projective and you want to deal with modelized spaces on that. So uh, this is the reason, t there are some motivations which come from this kind of, uh, of problems. So all on the talk, I'm gonna let S, gonna be a K3 surface to which I'm not gonna add any hypothesis clearly for the moment at least. And uh, I'm gonna talk about modelized spaces of sheaves over such a surface. So in order to do that, I'm gonna fix uh, some, some elements. And the first thing I do is I fix the Mukai vector of the sheaves. Which, uh, so if f is any coherent sheaf on the surface, then I define the Mukai vector, um, Mukai vector of f, of f is what I write as v of f, which is by definition the, the cup product of the churn character of the sheaf with the square root of the tot character of the surface. And this turns out to be an element in the, uh, in the integral cohomology of the surface, uh, which I will refer to uh, as the Mukai lattice of the surface. And I will always write it uh, as R Xi A, so I will give an explicit uh, name to any component, every component of, of this inside the, the, the integral cohomology. In particular, I just want to remark that R is gonna be the rank of the sheets we are which we want to parameterize, and Xi is gonna be their first term class, so in particular, it's something which lies in the neuron severi. And so this is the first thing we want to, we want to fix. Uh, so we are gonna fix the rank and the churn classes of the sheets we want to parameterize. And the second thing we want to fix is a polarization. So uh, if you recall, what happens in the, mm, when the base surface is projective is the polarization is, is an ample line bundle, so you can't do this, the same thing here. So we fix uh, a polarization is gonna be so, so polarization is a killer class. Omega, I will denote by Ks, the, the killer cone of the surface. So this is something which is fairly general. And then this allows us to, uh, to define a stability for sheaves. I will only talk about slope stability because uh, this behaves quite well in the complex world. You have this kind of stuff like the Kobayashi teaching correspondence uh, which are used in what we do. If you want to deal with the uh, Gizaka stability, nothing goes really as you would like to. So we, we, just, we just take in a case where uh, the, the stability notion is the slope stability and the slope is defined, uh, let me call it omega slope of F for sheets of uh, strictly positive rank is by definition what I call as mu omega of f is exactly as in the projective case, the, f the product of the first term class of a sheaf with the polarization omega, and then you divide by the rank. So the definition is exactly the same one you have in the projective context, but the point is that now this is gonna be a real number. Uh, in other cases, it's a rational number, but who cares? Anyway, this allows you to define a notion of stability, uh, and namely, F is, um, is more than a stable uh, if a distortion free, and for every coherent subsheaf of F, you need to ask for, for, for the fact that it has to be coherent, um, you have the, moreover, such that the rank of E is strictly positive and strictly smaller than the rank of F, we have that the omega slope of E is strictly smaller than the omega slope of F. So it's nothing really different from what happens in the previously known case. Uh, so coherent on S, yeah, yeah, sure, sorry. Um, so the definition is exactly the same one. Clearly, if you if you if you allow here the large inequality, then you you, uh, you call your sheaves uh, mu omega semi-stable. So nothing special. Uh, what comes special is the construction of the modelized space, which is well, it depends on what you what you mean by special. But 
the construction of the moduli space in the projective context uh, is a GIT construction, which is clearly not available in, the, uh, in this complex world. So you want to, to construct the moduli space in another way. And uh, the construction uses uh, another approach to moduli spaces of, of stable sheaves. And namely, uh, the first thing is a theorem which is due to Gozarev and Okonek. Um, which tells you that you have a complex, a complex space, a complex space, which is far from being a manifold. Um, let me call it MVS, which is the moduli space um, coarse moduli space of simple sheaves simple coherent sheaves on, on S with Mukai vector V. And uh, so this is a modelized space of simple sheaves. This is a complex space. Uh, the construction of it comes by the formation here. And this is like the pro it's, it's a complex space which represents or represents some functor. And then you have two. Uh, very easy remark, and namely, if f is mu stable, then it is simple. So among all the points of this moduli space, you get stable sheaves with respect to some polarization you have chosen. And moreover, uh, mu omega stability is an open property. So in particular, you can take the open substitute parametric with stable sheaves. So, uh, sorry? Non-separated in general, exactly as in the projective phase. So it's, it's, it's something which is really ugly. I mean, it's as ugly as you can imagine. <laughs> the, the, model, the, the open subset uh, of the omega stable sheaves Uh, let me call it M U V S omega inside of this complex space is the moduli space we are looking at, we want to look at, is the moduli space of mu omega stable sheaves with mu chi vector V. And this is the main character of the uh, of the talk. And we want to study the geometry of this object here. So I just want to point out that the construction really goes by the fact, really goes, it, it really works because stability implies simplicity. So if you want to look at the moduli space, for example, of slope semi-stable or Gizaka semi-stable sheaves or something like that, you can't, you can't use such a construction. Anyway, in, in this way, you can even define a moduli space of Gizaka stable sheaves. You have to define what the Hilbert polynomial is, but you can do this. Anyway, uh, so this is, the, um, this is the object we want to study. And it turns out that it shares many properties with moduli spaces of stable sheaves when the base surface is projective. And namely, it turns out that this thing here is, uh, is a complex manifold. Uh, can be empty. But uh, we consider them to be not empty. Actually, we have a result in the paper which guarantees that they are not empty. For example, we um, uh, it's not empty whenever, if, for example, the second term class is sufficiently big. So you take a rank, you take a first term class, then maybe it's going to be empty. But if the second term class is sufficiently big, this is not empty. Moreover, it even contains something which is locally free. For rank two, this was proved by, by Lepotier and Banica. Banica, I think it's written like this. Where, where is it? There's an expected dimension in the Sorry? There's an expected? Expected dimension? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now I'm, I'm going to come. Yeah, this is what I expect. This is, this is exactly as in the projective case. But uh, there are some more. It's easier, in general, to produce stable, stable stuff on a, on a complex surface. Because you have uh, sheets which are irreducible, for example. 
for locally free shifts which are reducible. This is the, this is the way we've, we show that this is not empty. This, the proof here, uh, when the rank is two, is due to Lepotier and Vanka, and we, we give a generalization of this. Uh, so it's uh, myself and, and, and Thoma for R, for any R. Uh, but we have no precise bound. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, smooth, smooth. The, the smoothness is exactly using the formation theory in, in the usual way. I mean, it's only because you're, you're on K3. And so this is, uh, this is the first result about non-emptiness. So we, for, let, me, let me just only every, every time suppose that it is not empty. We have no really real precise bound about this C2, how, how big it has to be, but it should be, it should be possible to write it down in, uh, in some precise way, but we just didn't want to, uh, to spend too much time in, on this kind of subtleties because it's, it, anyway, it's work, which is not uh, so easy. No, not in general. And uh, now I come to the point. Uh, the expected dimension, if it is not empty, is what you expect it to be. So it's v squared plus 2, where v squared is the square of v with respect to the Mukai pairing on the, on the even cohomology of the surface. So it's actually an even number. And a very important thing is a theorem, which is due to Thoma. Uh, it shows that it carries a holomorphic symplectic form. So uh, the proof is exactly the one you, 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 may, you, you might imagine. I mean, you, you have something, you, you define an Atiyah class, and then you, you define, you define, the, the, you define the, the holomorphic symplectic form, as, for example, in the book of Hoyplex and Lee, and that's the same kind of proof. But you, you need to, 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 to guarantee something. For example, existence of resolutions of sheets which are not locally free, which are not granted the, the complex world and not projective. But as we are on surfaces, this is possible. And then there are quite subtleties, in so many subtleties in this kind of, when you leave the projective world, there are a lot of things which goes on which <laughs> make you feel not so sure what you say. So uh, this is a very interesting result. And what I would like to say is exactly about the compactness, namely in general, this object here is not compact. Already when the surface is projective and omega is the first cross of an ample line bundle, yeah? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it like this for the cases we, uh, we have studied? It, it is, uh, it, it's really reducible. Um, so, um, <laughs> it's not compact, even if the base surface is projective and the first term cross is, an, as the first, is omega is the first term cross of an ample line model. Uh, but if S is projective, and omega is the first term class of an ample line bundle H, then there are some uh, further hypotheses which guarantee that the modelized space is compact. Namely, uh, then MUVS omega is compact if the two following conditions are verified. Namely, V is of the form R xi A for R and Xi prime to each other. And the second thing is that H is V generic. Or otherwise stated, uh, H is in a V chamber. So I come in a second to the definition of what a chamber is because I need it in a second. Uh, so the fact is that in this case, this is compact simply because you have something which is compact to compare with. Namely, which the modelized space of Gizaka stable sheaves, Gizaka semi stable sheaves, sorry, which is projected in general. And uh, by construction, if, if you add these two hypotheses here, then the, these two modelized spaces are the same thing. So a posterior it is projective, not only compact. Um, well, mm, just let me say what, what being in a V chamber is. So let me say what is a V chamber. This is a connected component.
of the ample cone to which you take out some hyperplanes. So you have a locally finite family of a locally finite family of hyperplanes. Uh, I let me write it in this way. So the union for d and w v of orthogonal of d, where w d w v is a set of divisors on the surface verifying some uh, numerical inequalities, namely the self-intersection is strictly negative and at least equal to, uh, sorry, at least equal to some number which is usually denoted by modulo v, which is uh, a number which only depends on v, actually even more, it only depends on the rank and on the square of v. So it's something which is pretty much determined. Uh, okay, so that's the um, the notion of V chamber. So any yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna explain in the following. I hope. <laughs> okay. So. No, it only depends on uh, this for K three surfaces. It only depends on uh, on the rank and on the square of the self intersection of V with respect to the Mukai pair. I can be more precise than that. I mean, I can give you the formula for. Uh, um, so that's the kind of hypothesis you need. So even if you ask something about the, the, the Mukai vector, then you have to add some hypothesis on the, on the polarization because otherwise you can find uh, sheaves which are not slope stable. So the point is what happens if instead of taking the, the, the surface which is projective and, the, the, and omega is the first term class of an ample line bundle, what happens about compactness when we move to the more general world? And that's a problem. But anyway, uh, the problem is that we can't, we can't make any comparison with any modelized space of Gizaka semi-stable sheaves. And even if there were one, one should show that it is compact. So I mean, it's, it's pretty much a mess. But what it turns out is that you have, there is, a, there is a condition which tends to be a pretty ad hoc condition, but we're going to interpret this in the, in the more familiar language in projective world. The condition is that um, MUV as omega is compact if the following is true. Namely, uh, if V is of the form R psi A, uh, any uh, mu omega semi-stable sheaf of, of Mukai vector, Mukai vector V psi B, where B I guess it is at least equal to A, but I'm not completely sure. It should, maybe it's the opposite one. I don't remember now. But uh, so you have much, m so many more uh, Mukai vectors to check. If, if for every mu omega semi-stable sheaf of s with such a Mukai vector is mu omega stable. Sorry? Um, so uh, that's, that's R. Yeah, you're right. Uh, same rank, same first term class, but the second term class uh, I don't remember if it is higher or smaller than the one you, you want to consider for your modelized space. So this is, a, this is a condition which appears first in a paper of Buchdahl. Uh, and then it is used in a paper of Thoma in another way. But they both guarantee, in, in, in both papers, one shows that in very different ways that under such a condition, the modelized space is compact. Well. This is granted, uh, but we want, given interpreta an interpretation of this in terms of chambers and in terms of hypothesis on the Mukai vector, and it turns out that this is true. This holds such a condition, I mean, 
this condition here holds whenever V is of the form R xi A for R and xi prime to each other, which is exactly the same thing we had before. And then we define uh, the polarizations. When you say this means the psi uh, is some kind of primitive. Uh, I mean, uh, xi, if there is something which divides R, it does not divide xi. Okay. This is the, the permittivity condition that I put um, on. Um, and omega is v generic. So if you look in the literature, there is no true definition of what v generic is for, uh, for killer classes. But we just take the same definition. And so let me copy it. Otherwise, omega is a v in a v chamber. And a v chamber is just a, a connected component of Instead of taking the ample cone, you just need to take the, the killer cone. And you take out the same hyperplanes. So you take V and W, so uh, D and WV uh, of D orthogonal, where WV is exactly as before. So nothing changes somehow. Um, and it turns out that this condition under these hypotheses is verified. So we know that the model I space is compact. Uh, and we always guarantee that uh, V-generic polarizations exist. How does the construction actually arise? How do you do this analytically? Uh, Buchdel does. Uh, it's, it's quite complicated. I, I, I don't know about, about Thomas' paper. I have to, I have to, 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 uh, to be honest. But Buchdel's, Buchdel's construction, it, it produces some compactification, which he says to be natural. But I have to say that I don't know about the, the way it's, 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 a, it's a very intricate construction. It gives, it gives a natural compactification, but it doesn't, it doesn't parameterize sheaves on the surface. It parameterizes sheaves on something else, which is related to the surface. But it's something which it verifies to be compact in an analytic way. And then uh, it says that if this condition is true, then these two, these two model I spaces are the same thing. Then, well, then one gets back a posteriori the compactness of the model I space. So that's a, an analytic construction anyway. And so uh, we have the same notion of degeneracy. And now we know that if S is K3, any V is of the form R xi A, where R and xi are prime to each other, and omega is degeneric, then we know that the moduli space is a compact complex manifold, which carries a holomorphic symplectic form. And we do show much more, namely we show, this is our result, uh, that first of all, the model I space is a reducible hyperkähler uh, of K3N type. So this is some, somehow what you, what you would guess to get. I mean, nobody would, would imagine to have something else. But uh, moreover, the, the kind of hypothesis we have put here uh, ensure that you can't deal with it with the very generic K3 surface. I mean, the, the very generic K3 surface is Picard group, which is trivial. Here, R and Xi have to be prime to each other, so Xi can't be trivial. So this is pretty much annoying because, yeah? Uh, oh, for me, hyperketa means carrying a hyperketa metric. So uh, the, 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 the holonomy group is contained in the symplectic oh, group. Right. And irreducible hypercalculator is the same as the symplectic group, yeah. Um, OK. No, I'm, I mean, I'm going to use the fact that you have a, a, a hypercalculator metric, but without being in irreducible symplectic, maybe. So uh, this is why I, call, I just put, OK. So, um, so this is pretty annoying, because we would like to consider even surfaces with three Picard group, which is trivial because we are actually removing the hypothesis of projectivity, so we would like to have something which is really far from being projective. But we are not able to do it at the moment. And in particular, if xi is zero, then there is no real hope to have that this is compact. Because it is not compact even in the projective case, so not in general at least. So I mean, uh, this is maybe the best one can get for modular spaces of slope stable sheaves. The second thing. Uh, is a more, more general, 
but this is pretty much the same thing which happens in the projective case. Namely, there is an, a Hodge isometry let me call it lambda v, between the orthogonal of v and the second integral cohomology of the moduli space if v square is strictly bigger than zero. Otherwise, let me just don't state this, but you have the same thing whenever v square is zero, then the Hodge isometry is between this one and the orthogonal of v mod out by the z module generated by v. So we get back the, the, the Bouvier form of, of, this, of this manifold. And there is something else that we, what we are able to show is an application of this. And namely, uh, the moduli space is projective if and only if S is projective. Which is something which is maybe funny. I mean, uh, we really produce something which is not projective. I mean, it's whenever the base surface is not projective. So, uh, and this is just an application of this one together with Heuberg's projectivity criterion. So you need to find a 1-1 one, one class here whose self-intersection is strictly positive. And this is possible if and only if the base surface is projective. This is, a, this is a real stupid computation, I have to say. I won't say anything about the proof of these two parts here. I just concentrate on the, the proof of the first part, which for me is the most interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly the same proof you can you, you have in the projective context. The point is that we, you need to produce a deformation. So I will tell you how one produces the deformation, but I won't check that the, the morphism is very fast. Is it, anyway, it's exactly the same morphism. I, I, I mean, someone calls it Mukai morphism, someone calls it the Donaldson morph. Yeah. They work with family right? Yeah, exactly. That's the point. That's exactly the point. But we are not really using exactly such a thing. We are mo more using moduli space of twisted sheets to deform. So uh, the same idea, I mean. Uh, it's, it's exactly the same idea that you're working with family with moduli spaces of simple sheets. So you can produce relative moduli spaces. And then you, you have even quasi-universal families in a relative version. And then you can produce this morphism in families. So it's exactly as, as, as neat as you can imagine to be. OK, so all the remaining part, which is not so much, but uh, I'm going to try to describe you the proof of the first part of the theorem. And um, well, first of all, let me just mention that if S is projective, and omega is the first term class of an ample line bundle, <coughs> then this is known. And to look carefully, uh, the, the, this statement here can be seen in the paper of O'Grady. Uh, 95, I'm, I'm not sure, but well, middle of 90s. If S is projective and omega is the first term class of an ample line bundle, hence we are done. There is nothing to, so it's not that we are done, O'Grady was done. So, um, so we know what happens in this case. The second thing is we start to drop hypothesis. So the first thing to do is we drop the, the fact that omega is the first term class of an ample line bundle. So now we suppose just S projective and omega is not the first term class of an ample line bundle. And well, in this case, there, are, there, there is already something to prove. It's not so immediate. And what we do is the following thing. So um,
So what one does is the following thing. So the main idea is that we would like to, to, uh, to make comparison with something we already know, namely the first case, omega is the first cross of an ample light bundle. And we indeed prove the, the two following things. But I won't say anything about the proof because it would take time and I won't have the time to, to talk about the other case, which is, in my opinion, the most interesting one. So we prove the two following things. So the first statement we prove is that if you take any chamber in the killer cone, then, and this is quite surprising, uh, the chamber intersects the ample cone, any chamber intersects the ample cone, this is quite, so, quite, this is quite surprising. I, I, I don't know if, well, I wasn't really expecting such a, such a thing. This really says that the, the, killer, the, the, the walls in the killer cone do not behave so widely as you can imagine. Widely, I'm sorry. And the fact is that the picture you, you have to keep in mind is that if you take the killer cone inside H11, then you take the neuron severi, and the intersection is going to be the ample cone. So a priori, you could imagine that the V walls that you need to cut out are things of this form. Or maybe, I don't know. Well, this, what we show here clearly shows that the, we, we actually, we actually mm, as you say, we, we, we add too many walls. So for example, this chamber here does not intersect the ample cone at all. So they say that this is something which is, is far from being what happens. Uh, and you, we have two kinds of phenomena happening. One is that, for example, two or maybe more walls intersect in a point, point or in something which does not intersect the ample cone. And we show that this is not possible. And the other thing is that we show that the co-dimension of the intersection in H11 is the same one as you have in the neuron severi. And so this thing here cannot happen anymore. And the point is that the only ingredient you need to show this is just the fact that the intersection form on the neuron severi is non-degenerate. That's the most important thing you use. And you, then you need, you need to work a little bit, but I have not, not, not the time to show this. But it's quite a funny, a funny statement, I think. And moreover, as a consequence of this, you, you immediately have that uh, the intersection is a chamber in the ample cone, and any chamber in the ample cone contains an ample line bundle. So in particular, you get an ample line bundle in C. In any chamber. The second thing we show Sorry? This point is only for the case where for any surface. This is true for every surface. Yeah. This is true for every surface you can imagine. Killer. Yes. Killer, because you need a killer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's really, really general. And the second thing we show is that uh, if you take, well, it's not we showing this, but you take two polarizations lying in the same chamber, then the corresponding monolithic space are the same thing. Well, even this. I have to say that the proof is exactly the one you have in the projective case. This is the philosophy of the proof is exactly the same. But, well, you are dealing with omega and omega prime, which are killer classes. And you need, for example, so something like the fact that the slope with respect to a killer class, the family of sheaves having bounded slope form a bounded family. What does bounded mean in the complex in the complex dictionary? I mean, so it's 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 something which is not so easy. You 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 have been you have to be careful for this. And the, for example, the statement of this can be can be seen in a paper of Grib and Tom. It's it's not so easy. You 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 have to work to show this. Uh, so you put these two things two things together, and then you get the statement for the base surface 
projective. So now we can move to the case now, I mean, I didn't say anything, but uh, let me move, let me move to the case where S is not projective. And here, the situation is, uh, the only thing you can imagine to do is that you want to deform to something which is already known. Namely, something with base surface is projective. That's the only thing you can imagine to do. And indeed, it should work. And the, the, the effect that you have is that if there exists a smooth and proper deformation, let me call it curly M, to some connected base, such that uh, of a smooth proper deformation of the modelized space such that first every fiber is scalar no no unfortunately not I, I show you why it's scalar that's the interesting part and and the second thing you ask for there exists a fiber of K3N type, then we are done. Because smooth and proper deformation means the topology is the same one as the one fiber. As every fiber is scalar, even the odd numbers are constant. And then everything is determined by one fiber. And so we know that one fiber is reducible hyperscaler of K3N type, if and only if every other fiber is along such a family. So, uh, so if we are able to find such a family, we are done. But the point is that if you, if, you look at the, if you look at the hypothesis, in particular, this tells you that the central fiber has to be killer. And that's far from trivial. I mean, um, one, ha one, should write, one should produce a killer metric on the model I space, as you said. And that's not easy at all. I mean, there is one case where it is possible to do it, namely if uh, the model I space parameterizes only locally free sheaves, then the killer form is clear, is very well known, is what is called the, the Vi Peterson metric. And it's something which really comes from, from differential geometry, let me say. Then the Vi Peterson metric which is something which is really explicit. It turns out to be killer simply because the base surface is killer. And, but we are from, I mean, first of all, we don't even know if you have a locally free sheaf. And even if you have one, then you have an open subset, which is only an open subset. So you need to extend the killer form to the whole modelized space. And again, this is far from trivial. But we have a result, we found in the literature a, a, a very impressive result, which is due to Turing. And I think 86 or 87, I don't, don't exactly remember the, the year. But Turing shows that if V is of the form R0A, then the modelized space we are considering is killer. And he proves this by showing that if you have a locally free sheaf, then you have this Vipeter symmetric, and then you can extend it. I, wish I will, I will, I will uh, explain you how. And in its proof, actually, it's hidden the fact that even if you have, don't have any locally free sheaf, then you, you can produce a metric. And uh, that's very impressive, but it's not exactly what we would like to have, because here Xi is trivial, and we don't want it. So w for a while we said, I, I, I have even to say that if you look at Turing's paper, and if you only look at the, the final statement, you don't find such an hypothesis. So we were really happy when we found such the, 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 the paper. But it turns out that it, in the proof, it really uses in several places the fact that xi, xi has to be trivial. So we were a little bit deceived. But then you said, OK, it's, it's, it's maybe the occasion to do something which is more Interesting, I don't know. So, um, 
let me explain you the strategy of Turing's proof, because it's the same one we decided to, to use. And okay, the strategy is the following. So this works in the following way. Turing strategy what he does is that he shows he produces a complex complex a, a, a complex manifold curly m curly m with, together with a holomorphic map because I'm used to use the letter P, to P1, which verifies the following hypothesis conditions. First, P is a submersive vibration. Second, you have the central fiber is the moduli space. For a moment, it's just a holomorphic map. We don't know it's submersive. No, here is just a K3 surface. I, I, I. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, its statement is pretty general, but it works when the base surface carries a hyperkilometric. So um, s the setting is general, but then at some point it needs to specify to the case of hyperkiller surfaces. So you take the fiber, and there exists, and for every point in the fiber, there is a holomorphic section passing through S. To F, sorry. Whose normal bundle is the direct sum of copies of O of 1. The third condition is that there exists an isomorphism between the relative tangent bundle, the relative cotangent bundle tan tensor with the pullback of O of 2, whose restriction to any fiber is a holomorphic symplectic form. And the last condition is that you have a real structure on curly M. Let me don't write it, but it has to be compatible with 1, 2, and 3. And moreover, it has to induce the antipodal map. On P1. So this roughly says that you have the fiber over T. It has to be sent by this real structure, which is an endomorphism of curly M, uh, real endomorphism of curly M, uh, sending the fiber over T to the fiber over the antipodal of T with the complex conjugate complex, uh, complex structure. So that's roughly what it says. Well, this pretty mysterious list of conditions Exactly. That's that's what's it's real. There is a theorem of Hitchin, Carlide, Lindström, and Rocek, which uh, shows you that then this thing here is a um, then the central fiber is hyperkiller. Carries a hyperkiller metric.
and curly M is its twister, twister family. So we get two at once, namely, first of all, not only, in particular, we're interested in the fact that it's Kedar. But as it, it carries a symplectic form, then it has, it's, it's expected to be hyper -keda. But moreover, we have a description, explicit description of the twister family. So that's very powerful theorem, which is, yeah? Is this no, 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 no. This, this work here was, um, I think it's maybe four or five years before, uh, before Turing's paper. But I, I have to say that maybe, I, I mean, I'm not aware of many things, but <laughs> I mean, uh, that's the only paper where I've, I've seen this result really applied to something like showing that something is, uh, carries a killer metric or something. It is, or to produce a very, very explicit twister family by starting with some, something which we e don't even know is scalar. So it's, it's a very impressive result. And what is more impressive, I think, is hitching Kaledelin's tomorrow theorem. This is very, I mean, it's a very, very beautiful result. Exactly. So, uh, so exactly. So, how does one produce such a family? So, the idea is, uh, how does Turing produce the curly M? And the, the construction goes in the following way: you take the K3 surface, which I see as a topological space together with a complex structure. Let me call it I zero on S. Then you know we are considering the model I space, so we fix the killer class, a killer form, killer class. And then this means that you have chosen a Riemannian metric on the surface. Which is compatible with I0. And the associated form, the class of the associated form is omega. So let me say this by saying giving omega. Then you take the twister family of this metric. And we let the fiber over T, it's called ST. This is, a comp this is the same topological space with another complex structure, IT. The, the Riemannian metric is the same, it's still compatible with IT, and G and IT give a killer, for, a killer class omega T on the killer cone of the surface ST. So in particular, this tells you that you have a polarization on the surface immediately. It's not only the surface, but even a, a polarization. And so the natural thing to do is try to consider the relative modelized space of stable sheaves. So that's curly M in Turing's case. Notice that Every, every sheaf on the central fiber deforms along P1 because the function class is trivial in this case. This is why he can get the, model, the relative model space. In our case, this is not so easy because the point is that, so what happens? I'm quite late. What happens here is that So the relative modelized space in this case exists. The point is that in our case, the first term class of the sheaves is not trivial. In general, it does, it does intersect the killer form, moreover. The slope in general is, is not zero. Hence, f does not deform. Along p1, in particular, the first term class 
is not in the neural severity of the surface ST. And so the point is that you have an obstruction. So what is the obstruction? The natural thing to do is to, to see psi as a class here. And if you tensor with Q over Z, then this is isomorphic to the bra group of the surface ST. So this tells you that the obstruction is something which lies in the bra group, which is quite conceivable. And so the, 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 the only guess you can do is that, uh, well, instead of taking the relative moduli space of stable, twist, of stable sheaves, you need to pass the twisted sheaves. S, S, T. I mean, it's constant along the uh, along. Um, OK, so that's the, that's the idea. So I'm sorry, I have to skip all the details about twister sheaves. Uh, so the idea is that you take the relative moduli space of stable twister sheaves can be produced, can be constructed. And giving a family P from curly M to P1. Oh, the construction which we, uh, we have uh, uh, is, is not the one you find literally, simply because the only cases where the, the, the moduli spaces were produced is, the project is when the base surface is projective and the polarization is an ample line bundle. And you, you found it in a paper of Yoshioka or in a paper of Lieblich or whatsoever. But so we need a different construction. And the construction is somehow very similar to the one I used at the beginning. So one has to, to construct some moduli space of simple twister sheaves. Inside of it, then you have to find an open subset of stable twister sheaves and so on. It's not so easy, but it works. It really works. Uh, the point is that you have such a relative family. Let me write the, f the fiber over T. Uh, let me write it as MD. I just. Use this notation. Alpha t is going to be the twist. W is a Mukai vector, because there is no a, a, a unique definition of what a Mukai vector is, because you need, I, I use as a definition of Mukai vector the one you find in the paper of Ulbricht uh, and Stellari, uh, defining, for example, the Chern Carter by means of, but you have to fix an alpha t twisted vector bundle. Then you define a Chern Carter using that. And then you define a Mukai vector using that. I'm sorry, I need the time to give you the details. I just want to explain you why you have the deformations along the P1, which is the maybe interesting part. The fact is the following. So you choose, so y f in the central, fi in the central fiber deforms. Uh, and the idea is that you take E, first of all, you take E in the moduli space, and you take curly E, and then E is going to be, is B-dual. So this is again mu omega stable, locally free. It has the same rank and the, and the, first, and the same first term class as curly E, the second string class is clearly different. But what you do is that uh, then you take A0 is the sheaf of endomorphisms of E. So this is an Azumaya algebra whose class in the bar group is trivial. And it has the following property. It is mu omega semi poli stable, trivial slope. And locally free. And moreover, it is an Azumaya algebra. You take the three property, the, the first three properties here, then you have the Kobayashi Hitching correspondence telling you that it carries an anti self dual connection. Then what you do, recall that you have a non-holomorphic projection for the twister space to one fiber. You take the pullback over E0, you call it A, 
this is a priori just a complex vector bundle, but this is much more than this. It turns out to be a holomorphic vector bundle. And you take its restriction AT to the fiber over ST. So this is again a uh, trivial slope. Uh, it's locally free. And carries an of dual connection because having an of dual connection is something which only depends on the metric and the, on, the, on the signature of the surface, which is constant on the twisted family. So in particular, you put these together, and again, by the Kobayashi Ichin correspondence in the other side, you know that this is going to be mu omega t poli stable. Now, is mu omega t poli stable? You know, its first term class is always trivial. And then a result of Verbisky, which I found in a paper of Markman, is that AT is an Azumai algebra. It's a hyperomorphic mu omega t poli stable. So AT is an Azumai algebra. So it defines a class in the broad group of the surface. And it turns out that it is exactly a class which is defined by Xi in the broad group of ST. Well, um, moreover, there exists an alpha t locally free twister sheaf, AT, whose sheaf of endomorphism is AT. And as you have something which varies in a holomorphic way along, along P1 to compute the Mukai vector with. Then, moreover, now this is just the basic elements you need for the, for the construction. Then I just describe what, the, what is left and then I'm done. Or I need to stop, it's better to say. Um, Now I, I want to describe the deformation. Sorry, I forgot. And I describe the deformation only for a locally free, t uh, for a locally free sheaf. So you take one locally free, then the first thing you do, you define G zero to be F times E dual. This is going to be mu omega poli stable locally free, or trivial slope, locally free, and it has an A0 module. Again, the three properties guarantee that you have an anti self dual connection. You do exactly the same, the same game as before, then you provide GT on ST, which is um, trivial slope, locally free, carries an anti self dual connection. Then you know it's going to be poly stable. And again, the same kind of arguments as before, which I didn't describe, but which are due to Verbitsky, tell you that uh, GT is an AT module. Hence, it turns out that there exists FT locally free and alpha T twisted such that uh, GT is FT times ET dual. Well, 
the Mukai vector, the twisted version of the Mukai vector, remains constant in some, in some sense. Um, then this, this tells you that the only thing you need to verify is that it is stable. That's not easy, but if t is going to be stable, and this is something which is the Kobayashi Ichin correspondence for twisted sheaves, which has been proved by Wang one year, last year, or maybe 2012, I think, which is something which is really powerful. And this guarantees that Ft is stable. So in particular, Ft will be in the moduli space that we would like to, uh, to consider. And so this gives you the w why it deforms. And this even describes you the section which passes through the, the starting F. If you want to start with something which is not locally free, then the situation is a little bit more intricated, but I won't describe anything. We need to check all the, all the, all the conditions of the theorem of Ichin, Karli, De Lindstrom, and Rocek. This is not so easy, but it follows the same kind of arguments of Turing, in Turing's paper. And as it turns out, this is Keda. Then one needs to provide the deformations. I don't have the time to describe it, but. Uh, yeah, now we know that every modulized space is Keda. And then we need to define a, a smooth and proper deformation of the moduli space to something which is of K3N type. And we have a way to do it, which is not so immediate. We use twist lines in the period domain. And, but following only twist lines, we are able to provide something which deforms to, uh, to a moduli space of this sort, but over a projective K3. And then we already know the result, and everything follows. So. I think I, I, I stop here, so. Any questions? Yes, in the story for the same equation, how does the happen? Uh, no idea. I mean. Yes, it looks like well, the problem is, well, uh, in general, I would expect, well, uh, for example, if it depends on what you, what you mean by moduli space of semi-stable sheaves. I mean, if you, if you consider the, the donaldson nuremberg compactification of the moduli space of slope-stable locally free sheaves, then the point is that is very singular. You you might suppose you might suspect that it's like it's a, it has a killer metric, and it should be doable in the f in the same same lines. But I have not not really. Yeah, 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 yeah. You you have the, the this approximate uh, approximate Kobayashi Ichin correspondence, which allows you to do that. But it's. Um, the problem is really the definition of the moduli space, I think, in that case. And even the relative donuts on the limit compactification of things. I don't know exactly how sh it should work. So. Yeah. Your paper or it's, uh, of the moduli space, do yeah, you mean? Um, or the moduli space of? Uh, well, we we uh, we cheat. <laughs> I can describe you how we do that. But the idea is that instead of using simple uh, modules of the minor, we use the Thank you.